All right, welcome everyone. Hopefully you're in the right place after lunch. Uh, going to be talking. I'm Brian Hogg. I'm going to be talking about submitting, maintaining, and growing a plugin on WP.org or WordPress.org. Uh, this is the short form. So uh, feel free to ask questions. It is after lunch. Um, you know, if people were enjoying Montreal, you might have been out late last night. I might forget what I said two slides ago. So it'd be much better if you asked the question at the time rather than waiting a few slides and then everyone forgets, including me. So ask questions as we go along. So I've got some plugins, um, which you can see there. I've got some courses teaching some of this stuff, uh, learning center blog thing, and I uh, used to be the organizer of WordCamp Hamilton for a couple of years. Um, but I'm living in Cambridge. And one of the plugins is uh, the Events Calendar shortcode, which is an add-on for the Events Calendar by Modern Tribe, which I updated recently, so I know what I'm doing, <coughs> hopefully. <laughs> and the slides will be available uh, at this URL, which I'll show at the end as well, so you don't need to furiously take notes. So just a quick thing of who you guys are. So um, who here has created a, a plugin at all? Like even, even if you haven't released it, even a small one for a client or some code in functions.php that could have been a plugin. Sweet, awesome. And uh, who here has a plugin already on WordPress.org? A few. Cool, perfect, sweet. So, um, so I'm not going through actually creating a new plugin. So if you haven't already, hopefully you can just keep some of the stuff in mind when either you're writing a bit of code for a client that you're thinking, oh, maybe someone else could benefit from this and I should release it. Um, you can just keep it in mind as you're uh, building plugins or doing client work and uh, refer back to it later when you want to release it. So the story of the first plugin I created personally, I did one for a client before. Um, and just kind of how, how the first versions of plugins can be created. So this is a bar in Hamilton uh, called The Winking Judge. Uh, these grimy looking chairs seem to be kind of a bit of a startup mecca in Hamilton for some odd reason. So I was sitting on this grimy chair, uh, coding the first version uh, with a pint over here uh, of a plugin where uh, someone was sending newsletters to our local software development li uh, mailing list and getting the dates wrong of the events I was running because uh, we were flipping between Wednesday in the evening in Saturday in the afternoon. So sometimes they're putting Wednesday in the afternoon. And I'm like, no one's going to show up. Uh, are you doing this manually? And they're like, yeah. I'm like, oh, there must be a plugin for this. There wasn't. So I coded the first version uh, Yeah, in that chair. And at one point, uh, there was another startup that was an app that uh, three people sitting on this little couch uh, coding the first version of their app as people drunkenly sh shot darts up here above their head, um, which is like extreme programming to the next level. And it was a little scary for them, but they made it through and they made their plugin. So, um, but yeah, that's where the uh, the first uh, version of the the plugin I released uh, was made. And uh, you know, I waited till I sobered up before I actually released it on WordPress.org. Uh, Don't drink and release uh, should be a slogan as well as driving. And uh, yeah, it was uh, you know there were some hurdles to think about and things I had to kind of push through to actually get it released and and working the way it should. Um, so that's what I'll be going through today. So the first thing is obviously getting the plugin that you have or the code that you have ready to submit to WordPress.org. So how do we do that? So the really the, the main thing that differentiates a plugin that you can just have running on your own WordPress site or a client's WordPress site and something that's released on WordPress.org is the readme.txt file. So what does that look like? And it's literally just a readme.txt file that you drop into the folder of your plugin. And this is a sample of it. You can see it online there at uh, wordpress.org slash plugin slash about slash readme.txt or just search WordPress uh, sample readme. And it's, it's got a few sections which we'll go through. So it's got a short and long description of your plugin, uh, which if you remember back in the other slide is, is what shows up when someone searches for your plugin or finds your plugin on uh, wordpress.org directly. It's got tags or keywords. It's got a, uh, in, any installation notes, which a lot of times is just like, go to plugins, add new, type the plugin. Um, but if you have any special installation notes, then you can put those there. It'll have a list of frequently asked questions or FAQs, uh, which are kind of nice in the new design. You like click it, it drops down. It's like accordion style. So that works really well. Uh, so reference to screenshots. So if you have screenshots uh, that you upload, which we'll go through later, you can add just a description or what the caption will be under each screenshot and what the license is. And for WordPress.org, it needs to be uh, GPL. 
and then the changelog. So as you release new versions, again, we'll go through these sections, uh, you can make notes as to why people should update to the next version and what changes have been happening as you've been going along. So some tips on the readme.txt uh, to avoid any issues and not get into trouble and try and make uh, as, as findable as possible. So don't spam the tags. You could think, oh, I can put in like 100 different keywords separated by commas. Um, that'll definitely get you dinged in terms of the ranking and can even get you removed. It kind of looks like you're trying to game the system. So 12 is probably the max really that you should use. And you can look at other plugins as well and kind of check out um, not only for the tags, but for other things, there are other readme.txt files. Maybe you have a similar plugin or something in the same domain. See what tags they're using. And you, know, you can either copy those ones or uh, modify them slightly to fit uh, your own plugin. So <laughs> validate your readme.txt file before actually submitting it. So there's this validation tool, and it's easy to do over on WordPress.org. And you just either enter the URL if you've got the readme.txt hosted somewhere, or you just copy and paste it into the box at the bottom, and it'll tell you if you have any glaring issues. So there are a lot of rules uh, for WP.org uh, versus just, again, having the plugin on your own site or a client's site They need to keep in mind. So like I said, it needs to be 100% GPL compatible. So if you don't know about the GPL license, this is a license that allows the, the freedoms that, that WordPress has to uh, be able to copy the code, modify it, redistribute it for free, uh, if you'd like, um, and without any restriction on that code. So, but this isn't just restricted to the PHP code, which um, because a plugin depends on WordPress automatically is GPL. Uh, there are some debates on that, but really it's, that's how GPL works. But it also includes the images, CSS, JavaScript files, anything that you include in your plugin. So if you have like a JavaScript library that you're including in your plugin and it, doesn't, it has a commercial license or it doesn't have a license that's compatible with GPL, and I think MIT is even more liberal, so you, that works as well. Um, but everything needs to be GPL. So you need to keep that in mind where it's not just the PHP code, it's everything you include. And it needs to be readable as well. You can't like obfuscate it and like compress it and make it so that no one can read it and it's all encrypted. Um, it has to be easily changeable and readable. So include any files uh, for your plugin in your plugin. So don't like link to a CSS file or a JavaScript file on your own site. Um, or some other site, like just copy it and add it into the plugin. That way, if the site that you're linking to goes down, it doesn't take down someone else's site or stops your plugin from working or something like that. So you just want to copy and include them into uh, your plugin. Yes, go for it. Uh oh, I forgot already <laughs> what I said. <laughs> this one? Yep. Yep. Oh, absolutely, yes, yes. Yeah, I mean, like, Minified isn't too bad because you could, like, open it up. There's a little button in, like, Chrome that'll, like, prettyify it, like a Minified version. Like, the variable names will be cut to, like, E instead of whatever your thing is. But at least it's readable. Um, it's more so, and I've seen plugins that only have the Minified version just for space, even though it's not that much difference in space. Um, but yeah, it's nice to include both, right, so that it's easily modifiable if someone wants to. Uh, but it's more like encrypting it. Like there are things to like encrypt JavaScript or encrypt PHP, can't do that uh, at all. But it'll still run because it'll like unencrypt at runtime and stuff like that. Uh, stuff like that you can't do. But yeah, I mean, you, ideally you should have the minified and unminified, but that that's still readable at least. Yeah, still in text. We're good. So no tracking without uh, explicit consent. So this is tracking even what site the plugin is installed in. You can't do that. And that could be like you're hosting, uh, you know, you have an image file or a JavaScript file on your site that you're linking to from your plugin. So now you can see where the traffic's coming from for that file and, and see what sites the plugin's installed in. Um, again, you can do it, but you have to explicitly ask them permission. So they say like, hey, like check this box and click save to give permission or a prompt that you can dismiss that says like yes or no to like, and you can give incentive even to do it. Um, and there are a couple of plugins like Wisdom Plugin or Freemius Insights that give you uh, this ability to get things like the PHP version and that they're installed, the WordPress version, the site it's on, all that stuff. Um, and you just have to ask permission, but you can, you can still do it. Yep, go for it. Uh, 
Oh, um, sorry, I'm not super like uh, good on the GPU. Um, so just to repeat the question for the mic, so you're saying that if like you're including an image and you're tracking it because it's hosted somewhere or something, yep. Right, yeah. Yeah, so that stuff, um, yeah, you're right. And, but again, you shouldn't be doing that. I think it'll be actually denied if you're like hosting the files. This is really to like have your plugin uh, send data to like an API or a service or something to say like, oh, it's on this site, it's got this version of PHP, uh, stuff like that. So yeah, normally you wouldn't ever have a hosted image as part of the plugin, because again, if your site goes down, right, then it can take down or affect other sites as well. So yeah, so that's a good point that, you know, you could double track <laughs> or you know, track the visitors as well. So again, it's another reason not to include uh, those images in your plugin. Yeah, that's part of it. Good, and on that note, um, so no credits or links back to your site on the front end, again, without permission. So you can't just say like, you know, here's the plugin powered by uh, whatever on the front end of the site. You can on the back end, no problem, because it's not visible to the user. Um, but you can't say like, you know, powered by whatever your plugin name is on the front end, again, without asking uh, explicit permission. Otherwise, yeah, it can be removed. Um, so no nags in your plugins or uh, non-dismissible alerts. So if you have like an admin notice or whatever at the top, um, it just has to be easily dismissible either with a link, dismiss, or uh, an X to very quickly get rid of it. Um, and you just and you can't nag over and over again, like have the prompt be something that's useful to the user or just ask them once at an opportune time and that's it. Um, and this can include things like, hey, you've been using the plugin for a while, mind leaving a five-star review? You know, that's totally acceptable. Um, it just has to be dismissible easily and quickly. So nothing illegal, so you can't add bit mining code into your plugins. I mean, you could try. Um, I know I have, but you can't, uh, you can't actually do that. And after all these rules, and you read it to the letter, there is still the clause, which is this, that uh, they reserve the right to disable or remove any plugin at any time uh, for reasons not explicitly covered by the guidelines. But you got to remember, these like these people are volunteers. You know, they're they're not out there to on this vendetta to, to randomly delete your plugin for no good reason. Um, but they just keep that there so that if there is something that you know maybe they notice it isn't in the guidelines, but they feel should be removed, they have the right to do that. Um, and you are you know you're playing in their sandbox, so that that can happen. Um, but it's rare, not not for any bad reason. So now, how do you actually release your plugin? So again, ensure that your readme.txt file is valid and uh, validated before you upload. So you package it into a zip file. So you want your plugin to be in a folder. I know you can have a plugin as just a file.php, but you want to have it in a, a folder and just zip it. Uh, you remove the, the git. This is a kind of a joke for people who have been coding for a while, the CVS folder. Hopefully no one's still using CVS. But remove any uh, source control uh, folders that you have uh, before you make a zip file. And submit the plugin for review, which is the easy part. Uh, and then push the code up to SVN. So we're going to go through this so there's no mystery um, as to how this is done. So before you do it, uh, another tip is you also want to test with WP underscore debug turned on. So this is in your WP config. Um, as you're uh, testing your plugin or loading it on other sites, uh, you want to make sure that that is true because you really don't want your plugin to emit any warnings uh, or definitely not any errors uh, that are happening um, uh, as your plugin is being used and the code for your plugin is being run. Uh, you want to also check if you have JavaScript that there's no browser console errors, you're not uh, doing a console log or some you know, console.error or anything else um, when you go to release your plugin. And just a big note and a common fear that, that I hear a lot is you know, that, oh man, I don't know if I should release it on WordPress.org because then my plugin could be used with like any other of the 50,000 or however many plugins are there now and it's going to break and this plugin that's poorly written is going to mess mine up and they'll blame me and pitchforks. And um, You don't need to test with every plugin out there. Obviously, you should test with some common ones, like big ones like Yoast and Jetpack and whatever just to make sure you're not breaking sites that have these very popular plugins installed, but um, you don't need to support 
you know, this poorly written plugin that's still on the repo or some bad theme or whatever, uh, unless you want to and you have the time. But don't, just don't let it stop you from releasing your plugin because you haven't tested your plugin with every other plugin because that's just not feasible or, or possible, so. So now the easy part, once you've got this zip of your plugin, you can just go to plug uh, wordpress.org slash plugin slash add, and uh, you need to have a wordpress.org account, which you can get there if you don't have one already. Uh, very quick to, to register one. And one note on that, if you either don't have or already have one or don't, um, you cannot have an auto reply. So like you can never set a vacation message uh, or any kind of like, hey, thanks for your email, uh, auto reply from that email address. Like if you need to set up another email address, that'll never have that um, because it, it's a big reason why you'll get removed. Imagine when they send out a notice to all the plugin owners being like, hey, there's this thing coming up, or hey, the server's down for maintenance between this hour, and then they get back like 500 auto replies, and then that creates tickets in their system, and then they have to go through them one by one and make sure they're just auto replies. Um, so when that happens, they tend to remove your plugin, uh, sometimes without warning, um, because it just, it's so time consuming for them to do that. So just make sure you don't have any auto replies and, and never set one for your email. But otherwise, super easy. Now that we've done all the, the hard work, we just enter your plugin name, enter your plugin description, um, which can just be copied and pasted right from your readme.txt, and then uh, the plugin URL. So you can either you know, upload it to the media library on a WordPress site and put the URL there or put it somewhere else that's publicly accessible and uh, upload and uh, submit that form. Again, yeah, just, you can just use your media library to, to submit that zip. And one note on the plugin name, it uh, will get translated to a slug, you know, similar to a poster page. Uh, you can change your plugin name later, but you can't change the slug. So just be mindful of that and make sure you're happy with uh, the initial name that you submit and what slug it'll be turned into because you, you can't change that uh, after the fact. So once you've submitted it, now you wait. Um, again, they're volunteers, so there's no like, you know, it'll be done in two weeks or anything. Um, they're usually pretty quick, uh, but just remember they're volunteers and there's no, uh, no set time as to when your plugin will be approved. But once you are approved, yay, you get a uh, SVN repository, which will look like this. So it'll just be plugins.svnwordpress.org slash and then your plugin name. And just by running this, uh, SVN command, you're able to uh, download that initial repository onto your computer uh, where you can then uh, upload the actual plugin files for it. So they don't actually upload your plugin uh, automatically. They just you know run it, approve it, make sure it doesn't break all the things or have anything obviously wrong with it in terms of security. Um, and then uh, they just give you access to this repository for you to actually uh, publish it later. So when you uh, download this repository, you'll have this trunk, you have a couple other folders, but the main one is this trunk folder. And within it, you just copy your files, uh, your plugin file, any includes, whatever you need to. You just do SVN add uh, trunk, or you could use a SVN client, but um, I tend to use uh, just the command line for, for this stuff. And I've got a blog post uh, on the exact commands plus these slides. And then you use the svnci-m and then whatever message saying, hey, this is the first version of my plugin. And away you go. So now, uh, after a couple minutes, hopefully, unless they're behind, it could be a bit longer, you just go to wordpress.org slash plugins slash your slug, and it's there. Yay. There should be like confetti that comes out of your computer or something when it's released, but unfortunately, not quite yet. Technology is coming, I hope. So now that you've got the initial version released, you can add screenshots, uh, icon, header images. I'm sure you've seen this when you're searching for plugins that just make it a lot more you know, visually appealing and uh, you know, more likely that someone would trust it enough to install it on their own site. Um, and the way you do that is there's an assets folder. I can't remember if it's there initially or if you have to create it, um, but there's the assets. Uh, if you just put these files in the assets folder uh, screenshots are named screen, screenshot dash and then one, two, three, four. I can't remember the maximum or if there even is one, but you probably don't want to add more than nine or ten. No one will see it, just like sliders. No one sees past the first slide. And you can either name it uh, PNG or you could do it uh, JPEG, um, depending on which. I think there's a couple other formats too. 
And then in your README, you would add uh, the screenshot section. And then you know, for the first screenshot, you just have a one dot and then whatever description. And then two dots, second screenshot, and so on uh, for the amount of screenshots that you have. And then very similar process, SVN add your assets. And then do a commit saying you're adding your screenshots. And that's it. So now those will again get processed and then show up. And uh, if you search like WordPress org uh, image formats, it'll give you all the like sizes and stuff like that as to what ideally they should be uh, to display as well as they can. So now, obviously, hopefully, you're not going to just have a plugin and then release it and never do another update. So how do we actually release a brand new version? So first thing, obviously, you want to make changes to your code. Uh, and then put it into the trunk folder. You want to update the version number both in your readme.txt and in the header for your plugin, so they should always match. Um, yeah, it's unfortunate there isn't like a nice way to like have both uh, synced up because yeah, I can't count the number of times I've updated one and forgotten the other. Add a line uh, to your change log just so people, when they say uh, you know what's the details, they can actually see what's changed in your plugin. And then again, SVN add your files, and then SVN CI a message for your new version, just a brief uh, description. So you can do this, and that will release actually a new version uh, if you just update trunk and nothing else. But to make it easier uh, on yourself and also other people, if they want to some for some reason download a previous version uh, of your plugin, you can tag it. And the way you tag it is just you go back up once. You're in trunk. You go back up one folder. Uh, you copy your trunk folder into the tags with the new version number, so 1.1. And then you commit that. And so you're basically just copying trunk into the tags folder with the version number of your plugin. And then you commit that. And that will then tag uh, your version of your plugin in the, the repository. And so you end up visually with this. You've got your trunk with your plugin stuff. And then you just get tags 1.1. You release another version 1.2. And so on. So that'll, that'll just keep building as you uh, maintain your plugin for however long you want to maintain your plugin. Uh, make sure to increase the version number for every release. So every time you do this process and you actually release a new version, make sure you don't keep the same version number. Reason being, people who have already downloaded your plugin won't see an update, right? Um, so you just want to make sure you update, even if it's like a minor version, so 1.1.1, or I think you can go up to 4. Uh, just keep increasing the version number so that it looks like a new version. Um, there is a process, uh, I don't have time to go through it right now, with, um, so who here uses Git for a version? Yeah, so that's obviously the, the preference I think nowadays uh, instead of SVN. I definitely don't except for this use SVN. So there is a way you can do it where trunk is essentially a Git repository. So you just have your, uh, you clone your Git repository into trunk, um, so you have your Git folder. You know you don't commit that uh, using SVN. You can add it to the ignore. But I've got the whole process there on uh, on the blog on on how to set that up. And um, and then you just go into trunk, Git pull, and it'll get your your newer files. And then you can just use SVN to update uh, your plugin. Uh, but one big note is not to use this SVN repository as like your development repository. So as you're building your plugin and testing it and making changes, but you know they're not ready for release, don't use the SVN uh, repository to update those changes until you're ready to release them. Uh, reason being, every time you do a push, it'll actually not only uh, make a zip file of the current version, it'll make a zip file of every previous version, and just adds a lot more load uh, to their servers. So if they see you doing this, they'll either tell you to stop or send you a nasty message or something. But um, yep, so just only use SVN when you're ready to release a new version. So some tips, even though not going through how to create a uh, plug in at least some some quick tips on uh, the plugin code itself, uh, which you don't necessarily need to think about when you're just doing it for a client site, but will happen uh, when you're doing it for uh, the world. <laughs> so don't include, like I said before, um, well actually no, sorry, this is separate from including the CSS and JavaScript in your own plugin. You also don't want to, you know, enqueue it or have it available everywhere on a site that has your plugin installed. Um, I've got this uh, free course that you can watch to 
Um, just go through like ways that you can, oh, I only want my CSS to show up on this admin page or uh, on pages with, um, you know, that, that I want to on the front end, for example. Because um, otherwise it just really increases the chance that your plugin CSS or JavaScript is going to conflict with some other plugin, right? Um, so, yeah, just try to add your JavaScript and CSS only where you need it for your plugin. Uh, don't include your own version of jQuery. I think a lot less people are doing this now, which is exciting. Uh, but there is a very easy way to rip out the WordPress jQuery, uh, uninqueue it, and then add your, your own because like, I need this new version number. Um, don't, don't do that. Uh, the chance that your plugin will conflict and break other people's uh, code is very high. So just use the version of jQuery that's included with WordPress. And you can do checks on the WordPress version if you need to to know what version of jQuery is included in that version. Uh, do include a PHP WordPress check. So if you're using, you know, new five, well, new uh, PHP 5.6 uh, syntax, because uh, WordPress still has the minimum requirement of 5.2, um, definitely include like a little, uh, there's a little snippet there. There's a couple other ones as well. Um, if you just search like PHP requirements or PHP version check, or WordPress version check, and uh, just check to see like, oh, is the minimum version 5.4 and WordPress, I don't know, 4.1? Yes, cool, do nothing, all good. If not, deactivate my plugin and show a little message saying, hey, you don't have the minimum version, uh, you know, please upgrade or something. Uh, that way your plugin, when it's activated, doesn't break the site uh, because of a syntax issue. So there are a surprisingly large amount of people who are using old versions of WordPress and uh, PHP out there. So. Uh, could do a quick check. Uh, do use apply filters and do actions uh, where it makes sense. I've got a whole talk uh, on WordPress.tv on um, you know how to make a plugin your own and the way that other people can extend and modify your code without hacking your code uh, is by using these you know apply filters and do actions so they can affect how your plugin works without having to to hack the code itself. Um, so definitely include that where it makes sense so that other people can extend your plugin and it just makes it a lot more usable for, for people um, to use. Uh, do make your translation or plugin translatable with functions like double underscore. Um, I've again got another talk on how to make a plugin translatable and different kind of nuances uh, with that. Um, but the more effort, and it's not like you have to translate the plugin, like you don't have to do the strings in another language at all. It's just the ability for it to be translated um, because there's a nice little UI for WordPress.org plugins where someone can just go in and uh, translate the plugin without any input from you and then it gets approved and uh, people can use your plugin in their own language. So super awesome. I uh, do add a plugin help page. Uh, so for example, with uh, the events calendar shortcode, uh, I added, you know, because WordPress, I added it to uh, uh, the submenu of the events calendar itself with the little link shortcode. Then I have this beautifully uh, designed um, page. Why, why are people laughing? I don't understand. Yeah, <laughs> so, yeah, definitely not the prettiest of design, but it works. Um, and it's got the basic shortcodes, the options, link to a short walkthrough video, and stuff like that. So this dramatically decreases uh, support uh, for your plugin by having the help available within WordPress itself. Um, so that's great. So do test, 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 <laughs> obviously. But again, um, you know, don't, don't stop the fact that you can't test absolutely everything from ever releasing a plugin or a plugin update. Um, you know, like classic example, uh, not too, too long ago, like Jetpack was a 4.0, broke like tons of sites, like white screened, uh, and then 4.0.1 came out that still broke most sites, um, and then 4.0.2 came out and it fixed it. So, I mean, this is a plugin with million plus installs that can do this. Um, you know, so it's, <laughs> I'm not saying break everyone's site because you can, but uh, just be available when you release a new version. Um, you know, don't, you know, push through, yeah, don't do something like uh, pushing a release, uh, forgetting to include a required file, uh, then going to a concert with bad cell phone reception. Um, I've, I've totally never done this. Uh, Breaking Benjamin is a great band, by the way. Um, so <laughs> it was terrible. I had to use, like, my wife's, like, Android phone to uh, somehow SSH, and then someone had to help me add that file. So, yeah, don't do that. Um, so definitely, yeah, test. Uh, add it to a version, stick around for a while after you push a release, and just be helpful. Um, if someone reports an error, just do the best you can, fix it, and 
people will forgive you. Um, so now the last thing that maybe a lot of people with, uh, or the few people with uh, plugins already, so how to, how to get more users for your plugin. Sadly, you don't have any magic uh, formulas. Uh, word of mouth social is definitely a, a big piece. Um, yeah, the, the, especially the one, the first plugin I released, most of it has been word of mouth. No paid advertising or anything else, but um, yeah, I mean, it's, it's great that you can literally tell someone, say at this conference, to say, hey, you can go to your site, go to plugins add new, type the name of my plugin, and you can install it with one click, right? Um, that makes it a lot easier for someone to be able to test and try your plugin and, and see if they uh, can use it. Uh, YouTube how-to videos has been super helpful um, for, for a couple of mine. Uh, just quick, like, hey, I'm going to just show you how to use it and you know, quickly go through how to add it in case they're not familiar with the add process. Again, very easy, plugins add new, type the name, install. Um, and then just show them just the basic functionality. And it just, you're just trying to be helpful, and that uh, definitely helps uh, people to take the mystery out of how to uh, get your plugin uh, working the way they need. Uh, frequent updates can help, and by frequent, I mean every six months. <laughs> like, it's not super frequent. Um, there is an article that Freemius uh, put out on SEO kind of for the plugin repository. It's public, like the way that uh, the rankings of uh, plugins happen. So you can check that out. There are some, and they do put notes in there. It's like, hey, this is part of the algorithm. Like, I think you can create a WordPress username that's like a keyword, <laughs> and then, you know, and that will actually make it rank better, but that'll also get you banned. Uh, so, <laughs> so just because it'll help your ranking doesn't mean you should do it, and they do make notes on that. So yeah, <laughs> read, read the fine print or the notes on there where yeah, they say, hey, this is helps, but don't do it because it's not allowed. Um, but it is, it is definitely hard. Uh, I mean, if, if a plugin like Write Meow, which will take all the, the instances of now with Meow, uh, only has like, a few, fewer than 10 installs, uh, you know, it's, it's a really hard uh, way to get a lot of plugins uh, or a lot of people using your, your plugins out there. But, and older plugins are favored a lot more than uh, newer ones, unfortunately. Uh, again, that's how the algorithm works. So. Um, yeah, you know, it, it's hard to get uh, new users, but it's definitely worth it. It takes time, but again, nothing beats uh, being able to tell someone that you can go to plugins add new, type the name of, uh, of your plugin, and uh, add it. So again, I've got the, uh, the plugins, courses, um, you know, the WordCamp uh, Hamilton's already finished this year, but maybe next year. And uh, again, the slides are here. So happy to answer any questions. Yes. So question is, uh, you know, any recommendations for the support requests that come in and how to handle them? So um, yeah, it's definitely the most common fear that I hear on either releasing a free or a premium uh, plugin. But, um, and, and I'm very surprised that the front end, like shortcode plugin that I've got, like doesn't have uh, as many or more support requests than it does. Um, and I think just, you know, adding the documentation, like as a question comes in, like, kind of think about, okay, why do they have that question? Like, you know, and, and is there some way I can either change the plugin itself or add some documentation to like walk them through? Um, and then over time, that kind of helps where, yeah, over time you'll improve the plugin, improve the documentation and get less of those questions. And it's also very rare that like day one, you're gonna have, you know, 100,000 people using your plugin, right? So um, it is kind of a slow build. So it, I have yet to see like a plugin that, um, you know, you haven't, that it is an, an insurmountable amount of support, and it's just me who's doing support, and I have been for, for years, and even with like almost 3,000 installs, it still isn't uh, inundating. So um, definitely having a system, like unfortunately you can't link in like the free support forum, like you have to go to it and, and subscribe to it, uh, versus like a premium, you use some like Help Scout. Um, but yeah, just staying on top of it, like just being helpful. Um, you don't have to, like I always recommend as well, if you're working full time or whatever, like you just, it's okay to, especially for a free version, to just on Friday afternoons. That's when I do support. You know, you do not need to answer like that second or something. Like it's great if you can, but you don't need to. Um, so time blocking as well can help uh, just keep it manageable personally, so it's not always distracting you from other stuff. So, yeah, hopefully that helps. No problem. Any other questions? Yeah. Yep. So the question, yeah, the credits on the front end, yep. Yeah. 
Mm-hmm. Yeah, they conclude the power bank. Yep, correct. Mm-hmm. Yep. Yeah. <laughs> no, um, that's not allowed. <laughs> so the question is like, oh, I've got these plugins that maybe are questionable, and they're you know they have a freemium model, and they have a backlink to their site powered by on the front end, etc. Um, no, if you find a plugin that does that, and I've I've done it, I you just send an email. I think it was at plugins at wordpress.org. Uh, send an email with the link to the plugin and say, hey, this uh, plugin is not asking my permission and has a link and. Uh, they'll send an email to the author, and if they don't reply, they'll get removed. So, no, you're not, it's not your fault. <laughs> it's the plugin author's fault. Sure. No. No. So, the checkbox has to be disabled by default. Uh, again, they can have links to their site and whatnot in the back end of the site uh, without asking permission, because that's fine. That's not publicly shown. Uh, but anything on the front end uh, needs to have explicit uh, permission. So, yep. Yeah, not your fault. <laughs> there's, well, there should be nothing hidden about it. It should be very uh, obvious to find. Any other uh, questions? Yeah. Yep. Mm -hmm. uh, every time. Okay, so the question is like when you first submit your plugin, it's reviewed, uh, validated for security and a bunch of other things. Uh, but when you make updates, is it validated? Um, and I think you're what you're trying to sneak in Bitcoin or something. No, okay. <laughs> um, <laughs> no, it's not. It's um, so I mean they they obviously can like if someone reports it like uh, like an issue like that or whatever, uh, they can go back and check it out. Uh, but no, like once when you release an update, it's available. You know, it can be available within like the minute. Uh, you know, two minutes after you push it. So, um, no, I think they do spot checks and whatnot to make sure, but there's no full validation and waiting a couple days to release a new version uh, after that initial one. So, yeah, it's very quick, which is scary when you have, like, <laughs> a lot of people using a plugin. You're like, oh, man, I hope I don't screw this up. <laughs> uh, any other questions? <laughs> Great. So I'll be around uh, all weekend, and uh, if you have any questions, feel free to, uh, to come up. Thanks, guys. Enjoy the rest of the conference.